Hey guys, we have a great show for you today, but before we get to that, I just want to remind you about our early bird special that we have going on right now for the Afterlife Awareness Conference. Uh, depending upon when you're listening to this, you may be right in time to catch the early bird price of $99 for this live stream. You might be listening to this podcast and that deal is already over, but want to let you know for the people who are listening and they have been contemplating whether or not to purchase the live stream ticket, you definitely want the early bird price. Um, we are going to have this price go up sometime in August, maybe mid-August. Haven't quite figured out what specific date yet, but I would say you might have five days, maybe 10 days here or there. And then uh, after the early bird special is over, the price is going to go up to $129. And then the day of the live stream, it's going to go up to $149. So you can be saving yourself about 50 bucks if you decide to purchase this live stream ticket today. And the way to get that ticket is to go to our website, path11productions.com. You'll see right on the homepage a big, nice red banner. You can click there. It will take you to the Afterlife Conference uh, live stream ticket. You can take a look at the schedule, or you can just type in path11productions.com slash AC2018. So obviously that stands for Afterlife Conference 2018. Pretty easy to remember. So I hope you guys head on over there. It's going to be a great time. We're so excited to go down there and film over 25 hours of content. The $99 price is a steal. I don't think you're going to find another live stream giving you that many hours of coverage at that price. People said, you're crazy. You're crazy giving it away. You're basically giving it away for free. So head on over there, path11productions.com slash AC2018 and purchase your ticket today. And thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 Podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. I'm really excited to have our guest on the show today. We have Matthew Dix, who is the best-selling novelist, 36-time Moth Story Slam champion, and five-time Grand Slam champion. In addition to his widespread teaching, writing, and performing, he co-founded with his wife, Speak Up, which produces sold-out storytelling performances throughout Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New York at least once a month. Matthew, welcome to the Path of Love podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yes, and you are also the author of the book that we are going to talk a little bit about, which is Story Worthy, Engage, Teach, Persuade, and Change Your Life Through the Power of Storytelling. I am. Yes. So let me tell you my little story and the synchronicity of how you came across my desk. Um, I was listening to a YouTube of Wayne Dyer on a walk. Uh, Wayne Dyer happens to be just one of the people that I love to listen to. I actually think he's an amazing storyteller and always look to turn to him and, and his lectures for inspiration. So I was listening to him talk and on my walk, I was thinking, gosh, he is such an amazing storyteller. I would love to learn how to tell stories a little bit better for my podcast. Um, when I'm not interviewing people like yourself, I do have another show that I call Food for Thought Friday. But I thought, gosh, you know, I don't consider myself to be a great storyteller. I don't even really know how to do it. I just kind of talk and tell my stories as I would if I was sitting across from a friend. Um, and then I was thinking, gosh, I wonder if there's any, uh, you know, classes or people that actually teach people how to storytell. And I left it at that. These were just my random thoughts as I'm walking. And sure enough, within 24 hours later, our assistant producer says, hey, what do you think about this guest? And I open up your bio. I take a look at the book. And I said, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> like, I was just thinking of this on my walk. And yes, please bring him on. Because not only do I want, want and need to read this book, I'd love to learn more about how to tell stories. Um, but I also knew that one you would be an excellent storyteller and a guest to be on our show. So that is how this all came to be. It's nice when the universe works out like that for us, huh? Yes, it is. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about yourself and for people who maybe aren't familiar uh, with the moth and have been introduced to your work, um, what kind of brought you into the world of storytelling? You know, it was sort of accidental, really. The moth which is a large international storytelling organization that I uh, 
I tell stories for on occasion. They produced a podcast, and I think they started back in 2009, and I started listening, and I loved it. I loved listening to people share their stories, and my friends started listening, and my friends told me, you should go to New York and compete in one of these story slams because you've had the worst life of anyone we know, so you'll definitely be good on stage. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's a terrible thing to say to a human being, and it's not entirely true, but I've had one of those unusual lives. You know, um, twice in my life I have stopped breathing and my heart has stopped beating and paramedics have saved my life. And I was arrested and tried for a crime I didn't commit. And I was homeless for a period in my life. And that's just like the, the tip of the iceberg of nonsense that really is my life. And so I told them I would go. And then I really had no intention of actually doing it. It terrified me. And eventually I stewed in shame for about a year and finally agreed to go tell one story once and then never do it again. And so I went to New York. I dropped my name in the hat. I, there's about usually 20 to 30 names in a hat on a given night, and only 10 of those people get drawn out to tell a story. So to be honest, I was hoping they didn't pull my name. I thought I could go home and say I tried and then maybe everyone would leave me alone. But they pulled my name last, and uh, I grudgingly got on stage. Actually, my wife forced me to get on stage. And then I told a story, and I, I won that slam. So I was the jerk who got to win his first competition. And that sort of launched the career. I hated every moment of that night until I began speaking into the microphone. And then all the fear and all the dread went away, and I just loved the time that I was standing in front of that microphone speaking to people. And what were you doing before that? I mean, did you have a different type of job or in a different line of work? Well, I've been teaching elementary school for the last 20 years. So I was doing that then and doing it now. And I'm also a novelist. So back then I had published two novels already. So I was sort of working in the world of story to a degree. I also own a wedding DJ company. So for the last 20 years, I was standing in front of wedding guests, speaking extemporaneously, not telling stories, but just sort of getting used to standing in front of bunches of people. So, you know, in a lot of ways, those jobs, you know, being a teacher and having the worst audience in the world, 10 year old kids, and uh, being a DJ and being a novelist, those skills sort of came together on the stage that night, I think. Yeah, I found those little bits um, of, of um, information that you shared about just those two things pretty interesting as being a podcaster about um, how you kind of learned through working with that DJ how to create like a tempo with your interview, how to cut in with the mic, how to lead your guest um, and as a DJ would need to do to lead the bride through the, you know, the tossing of the bouquet, you know, to people. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. I've never, never really thought about that before. And also maybe we could talk a little bit about the example that you gave how children tell stories and a lot of times they'll use the word and this and this and this and how you said one of the worst ways to tell a story is to use the word and it really is and it's not only kids if we're being honest a lot of adults tell those stories as well you know an, an and story uh, you know where things are just connecting what those typically are it's just a series of events so often people think that a story is some stuff happened to me today and I'm going to tell you what that stuff is you know, the classic example is someone comes up and says, let me tell you about my vacation. It turns out no one's actually wanted to hear the next sentence of that story ever in the history of the world. No one cares about your trip to the Bahamas. And typically what it ends up being is a list of the itinerary of your vacation and you insert food if it was especially good, even though it doesn't mean anything to anyone else because they're never going to taste it. So, so often we think of a story as this happened and then this happened and then this happened when really a good story is a story that's going to be connected by words like but or therefore, words where something was happening, but then this happened, or something happened, therefore, here was the result. And that's really the difference between telling a story and just telling about stuff that happened in chronological order. Yeah. And you also give the great example about um, kind of your near death experiences here and coming back to life when, you know, you stopped breathing. And we've had quite a few guests on our show. Um, our listeners really like to talk about, you know, is there a life after death? What's going on with consciousness and energy? Is there an afterlife? And 
But what was interesting, when you mentioned in your book that that's really not the pivotal moment of what grabs people of a story is the fact that you've died twice. It's everything kind of before and after leading up is really what draws the listener in and makes them connect with you. Yeah, exactly. You really can't connect on a near death like situation. That's that's not something we're ever going to connect on. If I tell you the story of the time I went through the windshield of my car and died on the side of the road, you've never had that experience, hopefully. And so you're not going to be able to sit there and say, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about, Matt. Uh, it's also sort of, although it's unusual, you can turn on the news at 11 o'clock and see you know, stories of car accidents and people surviving them and you know, nearly dying in them. So it's not terribly interesting in a lot of ways. It's interesting if you're, if you're me or if you know me well, but otherwise it's just another car accident story or just another bee sting story where I, you know, I got stung by a bee when I didn't know I was allergic. And the other thing about those moments is the two times that I sort of died and was brought back to life, I didn't know I was dying. I just sort of closed my eyes and then I awoke and was told later that your heart stopped beating and I stopped breathing. So I can't really have a moment. I don't even know it's about to happen. So so I have to make those stories about something else. All right. And do you mind if I ask you a little bit more about that story, just because it is a topic that we do like to cover? And ha- did those experiences at all uh, bring you to a different state of spiritual- spirituality and overall connecting with like your purpose of why you're here? You know, I wish that I could say yes, but tragically, no. Uh, you know, I, both of those experiences sort of put into my mind the idea that death is a real possibility. They both happened to me when I was 12 and 17. So you're, you sort of feel invincible at those ages. And so the idea that there's a finite, you know, there's a finite length of time on this earth that was firmly placed in my head, but it wasn't until I was 22, I was the victim of an armed robbery at a McDonald's that I was managing in Massachusetts. And, you know, after closing, three men came in with guns and uh, I couldn't open the safe. There was a sign on the safe that said manager can't open safe. And they didn't believe me. So they laid my head down on the tile floor and they put a gun to the back of my head. And they told me they they were going to shoot me if I didn't open the safe. And then they pulled the trigger on an empty gun. But that was the moment, unlike the other two, where I really understood I was about to die. You know, it, the car accident and the beast thing, I closed my eyes. In this case, there was a moment when I absolutely was certain that this was the end of my life. And that was really the transforming moment in my life for me, as terrible as it was, and it resulted in years of post-traumatic stress disorder. The fact that I can even talk about it today is sort of a miracle. Um, just saying those words out loud is an enormous accomplishment for me. Mm. But that was the moment I realized, like, I need to make sure that I maximize every moment of my life in every way possible. Yeah. And just in the way that you tell that story too, right? So I've never been in that situation before, but there is a way in which you are explaining it that captivates the listener and you can almost feel the panic, (laughs) the panic, the shock. Um, You know, what would I do in that moment, even though many people aren't in that situation like you are? Yeah, I mean, that's the goal of storytelling, really. In a perfect storytelling world, you feel something akin to what I felt in the moment that I'm describing. Those are the best possible stories that we can tell. And so hopefully I'm able to get you to that moment uh, in some way. I'm thankful that like most people don't have to experience that kind of a situation. But um, you know, I'm happy to hear that you felt a little bit of the panic that I felt that day, because that was the goal in that story. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned a lot about uh, telling your own story in the book. You said you mentioned how it's important to not really talk about other people's stories, but you can tell somebody else's story from your perspective. And then you're sharing with your audience and the people who are listening what was happening for you as opposed to just say, hey, guess, guess what happened to my friend this weekend? And then you're just telling their story. Right. Because that person isn't even real to the audience. You know, if I tell you about my friend, Phil, And the crazy thing he did, you know, at some point in his life, you don't know, Phil, and he might as well be a fictional character to you. I think that the stakes in a third person story really don't exist. Whereas even if you don't know me, if I'm standing in front of you, we have a physical presence and a a connection of some kind. It's not going to be strong yet, but I'm a real human being standing in front of you sharing vulnerability. 
sharing a third person story doesn't require any vulnerability at all. I can just tell you whatever unfortunate thing my friend Phil did without risking anything about myself. And so the best stories are told from a place of authenticity and vulnerability. I'm going to share something that is difficult to share and not often shared and hopefully we'll learn something from it or or be more connected or at least just be entertained. You know, there's nothing wrong with telling stories just to be a more entertaining and engaging person. And but stories also heal, you know, I mean, somebody's story can just have an impact on someone's life that they can carry with them throughout their entire lifetime. I mean, there's there really is a true power, I believe, in storytelling. Oh, no, I, I totally agree with you. The craziest thing that's ever happened to me in storytelling is I have told stories on stages and four times in my life, a woman has approached me after I've stepped off the stage and told me about her miscarriage. And in each of those cases, I was the one and only person she had ever spoken to about it. And the first time it happened, I just thought, this is crazy. I called my wife, I told her about it. I said, why would someone do this? And for my wife, it made total sense. Now she's had a miscarriage and you know, she and I understand the unfortunate blame that so often women place upon themselves when there's a miscarriage. They wonder what they did wrong and was it their fault? And so often it's a hard thing to talk about. It's just not a thing that we talk about often in our society. And so I stand on a stage, I, I open my heart, I speak about something vulnerable that most people don't talk about, and then I become a safe person where they, you know, these women could unburden themselves a little bit of this thing that they've been carrying. And then they don't have to see me the next day, which is also great because it's hard to tell like a coworker your deep, dark secret and then see them sitting in their cubicle the next day staring at you. But if you find a stranger who has an open heart, that can often really be a powerful thing. Yeah, and that reminds me of another person who I think is a phenomenal storyteller, who is um, Brene Brown, and she speaks a lot about the power of vulnerability, writes a lot of books about it. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her work or not. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, and you know, this isn't the exact quote, but in listening to her, I know that she said something to the effect of when you begin to get in touch with your own vulnerability and you can share your stories, you then give another person the courage to open up and find their vulnerability and allow them to step into a space where maybe they once never even thought that they would step into, but to see the courage of somebody else to be vulnerable um, can bring others that same courage to be vulnerable as well. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I am the, I am the bearer of so many secrets from people who have told me you know, things from their lives that they've never wanted to speak about until they hear me tell a story. And then when my wife and I are producing shows, quite often an audience member will be sitting in one of our shows and that audience member will hear six or seven people tell stories, and some of them will be deeply um, vulnerable and talk about things that don't often get talked about. And then suddenly that audience member, who never planned on telling a story in their life, finds the courage and comes to me and says, I have a story. If you will help me tell it, I'm willing to take the stage now. So you have to sort of see it sometimes before you can imagine yourself doing it on your own. Well, and kind of staying on that topic of vulnerability, what would you say was one of your most vulnerable moments in telling a personal story that maybe kind of pushed you to your own edge uh, after kind of getting involved in all this? It probably was becoming second nature. But are you ch do you challenge yourself to kind of bring yourself constantly to places of vulnerability? And if so, what would be one of the most vulnerable times, with the exception of the first story that you told <laughs> um, of getting up there? but. What, what else has really kind of tested your vulnerability in telling stories about your life? I mean, the hardest story I ever told was that story of the robbery and uh, stories. I have a couple other stories surrounding it. The first time I told the robbery story on stage, I actually don't have a memory of it. It's a perfect blank in, in my mind. I, I didn't understand it at the time. I thought I've been through therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. Now I can tell this story to 900 people. And when I got on stage, it didn't come out the way I planned it. And I don't remember ever doing it. Uh, I, it actually, it won that slam remarkably, even though I have no memory of it. But, um, I went to my therapist and asked, you know, a couple of days later what happened. And, you know, he said, y you're an idiot. You're, you can't get in front of 900 people and tell that without some preparation. You know, what were you thinking? So that was <laughs> sort of the, that was the hardest one. The story I never thought I would tell that sort of for me required the most vulnerability, I guess. When I was 20, I was, I was the stripper in a bachelorette party in the crew room of a McDonald's restaurant. 
And <laughs> it was something I hadn't even told my wife for a very long time. And one day, for whatever reason, I found the courage to tell her this thing that I did, which was just humiliating. And telling her and getting it out allowed me to tell it on stage and finally sort of put that out there. And now I tell it all the time because people love it. They think it's hilarious. I actually don't love telling it because it's too funny. I don't like stories that sort of hit one note. You know, I like to use humor strategically, and that story just can't be unfunny at any point. Uh, but that was the hardest one for me to tell in terms of vulnerability. I just didn't think I would ever reveal that secret to anyone in the world. Right. Yeah. And that, that's, those seem like to be some interesting circumstances to be. And I don't think I ever would have put all of those things in one sentence to say that that would be something that would actually happen. Um, It's a really bad situation. Yeah. And you know, I wasn't actually expecting to go in this direction, but I'm going to continue to go in it. Um, because, you know, in some of the work that I do, I'm a mental health therapist as well. I kind of, that's my day job, um, you know, and work with a lot of people and listen to a lot of secrets and a lot of vulnerable moments that people go through. And I also like to encourage people to take a look at those uh, darker aspects of themselves or the things that they are most afraid of and try to shine the light on them and embrace all of that so that they can become, you know, what they call the true authentic self or just really feeling like you're living who you are. Are. And that is, in an essence, accepting your stories, accepting uh, what has happened to you, uh, how you've worked through it. And then when I think about somebody like you, who is literally kind of on stage here and really using the power of story and personal experience to share with others, um, I can only imagine that you might feel a little more freer than the average human being, or what does that do for the soul and just kind of being in this world and sharing so much? Yeah, it makes you very self-reflective. So I'm always thinking about how things have impacted me and how they have changed me. And, And the other thing it does is, you know, I think a lot of times lives can seem like big messes and, you know, struggles can seem forever. But when you're telling stories, what happens is you end up putting sort of buttons on the end of things. Like your life isn't one long mess, but it's a series of stories that you can find sort of satisfying conclusions to, you know, meaningful moments to bring an end to something that has sort of been lingering in your mind. So rather than I was once, you know, homeless and all the awful reasons why I became homeless, it becomes a story that I share And then I finish the story and that like chapter of my life is now sort of finite and closed and useful to me in some way. So I'm able to take a lot of the suffering and the pain that I've experienced and sort of frame it and then use it and reflect on it and put it out into the world in a more positive way. So I I think I think a person who's not telling stories who lived a life like I have, I think they'd be more inclined to sort of just look back and say, that's just been a disaster rather than what I look back on now, which is a series of interesting and compelling and surprising and unfortunate events that I make use of in many ways now. Right. And, but there is that reflection, there's that looking at it, there's the telling of it. So it's not like this experience happens. It feels like a mess and you just store it and put it away. And, you know, it's not given breath and it's not thought about or written down, but you're, you're very active within kind of how your life is and, and looking at what those small stories could be, which leads me to another part in your book, which was really helpful for me when you were talking about your content, you're like, Oh my God, am I going to run out of stories? You know, I need more stories to tell. And, um, and I liked how you said, you know, at the end of each day, you would kind of just, um, you know, journal a little bit very quickly, different things that happen throughout your day, because as you said, there really are stories upon stories throughout our days that could be told if we look at them through that eye. Right. And I don't use the word journaling because I I just think when we use that word, people are pushed off. You know, that just sounds hard. You know, I use Excel, the spreadsheet program. I only permit myself the length of the computer screen in one Excel, you know, block to, to include that story. So at the most, I'm able to write two or three sentences probably each day about these moments. And the moments that I'm specifically looking for are story-worthy moments. So I do it every day. So regardless of how boring or benign my day may be, I ask myself, if I had to take a stage today and tell a story about something that happened today, 
what would be the most story worthy moment, even if it's truly not story worthy. And then if I, I've done that so long over time that I've developed this lens for storytelling, where now I understand that our lives are f- filled with meaningful moments, like truly life changing, life altering moments that we just either don't see or when we do see, we don't take a moment to reflect and to somehow save them and preserve them. So, you know, your child says something beautiful to you that makes your heart, you know, open and sore and makes you think makes you think about yourself differently as a parent. But then the next minute, the kid has spilled the milk on the floor and, you know, someone's walked in the house and the doorbell's ringing. And that moment, it's so lost to you. I, I just worry all the time about parents who don't take the time to reflect upon you know, their lives with their children, they end up sort of losing these precious moments in the midst of all the chaos that sometimes fills our lives. And in chapter seven, you say every story takes only five seconds to tell. And Jurassic Park wasn't a movie about dinosaurs. That's the title of chapter seven. So can you talk a little bit about that, about how every story takes only five seconds? Right. Well, every story is about what I call a five second moment, which is I just think stories are about transformation or realization. I was something, but now I'm this, or I thought this way, but now I think this. And I think that those moments tend to happen in a five second or less period. It's it's just that moment when everything sort of clicks. And it's always gonna be the end of your story because it's gonna be the most important thing that you say in your story. And it's always gonna be, the rest of the story is going to serve that moment, so no matter no matter what it is, whatever I have discovered about myself or the world or the way that I've changed largely or slightly, I, I'm really, I really do believe that these things happen very quickly. Uh, I think that it's a culmination of moments that lead to that singular moment, but that's the singular moment we're looking for. And the story is designed to serve that moment the best way possible. So I'm always making choices about what to say. So in Jurassic Park, for example, you think it's a, a movie about dinosaurs, but really it's a movie about a man who can't be with the woman he loves because that woman wants to have children and he doesn't want to have children. And that's all laid out in the first 10 minutes of the movie. You see it happen. And, you know, surprisingly, the man who doesn't want to have children ends up in Jurassic Park trying to save the lives of two children while they're being chased by dinosaurs. And if you watch the movie closely, as it moves forward, that man gets closer and closer to those children, both physically and emotionally, until in the end of the movie, he's holding them in his arms, holding them as close as you can hold two children. And that's sort of the end of the movie. That is, the man now loves children, so now he can be with the woman who he loves, and they can have children together. Now, Steven Spielberg knows that you're not going to go to a movie. If I said, hey, you want to go see a movie where a man doesn't love children, so he can't fundamentally be with the woman he loves, but through the course of the movie, he will find a way to love children, and therefore they can be together, most people aren't going to go see that movie. But if he puts dinosaurs into the story, and they have to flee dinosaurs while these you know, real transformations are taking place, then we have a great movie. And that's when you leave a movie and you say, God, that was a good movie. Even though it was a dinosaur movie, it just felt really good, and that's why. All right. So I guess my next question would be, too, um, can you make somebody who is not really that great of a storyteller um, a better storyteller by reading your book? I have yet to meet a human being who I can't make into a very good storyteller. Um, And yes, I think the book will help a lot. I think that being an elementary school teacher for 20 years, what it's taught me is that the best way to teach is to break large concepts down into small pieces that are easily practiced and repeated and applied. And so, so often when I hear people talk about storytelling and the teaching of it, they often either just tell you what they do, which is often not very helpful. You know, if you ask Usain Bolt, how do you run so fast? And he says, well, I move my legs really quickly. That doesn't help you in any way. They either do that or they talk in grand philosophies. You know, they, they speak in large terms. And I just don't believe in any of that. So if you read my book, you'll find that I break things down into very simple steps to improve your storytelling. And I think that's worked very well for me over the last five or six years that I've now been teaching storytelling. So I've had some truly, truly terrible storytellers walk through the door of a workshop. And by the time I'm done with them, they're able to take the stage and sound just great. All right. Well, that that's promising. And that's good to know. <laughs> uh, 
Because, you know, the other, the other part too, is I'm, you know, reading this book and trying to be better at podcasting and doing my job because this isn't my natural talent by any means. I, like I said, I'm a mental health therapist and an energy healer. And my business partner, Mike said, we should start a podcast. And I'm like, Oh really? We, and he's like, well, you know, yeah, you'd be pretty good at it. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know the first thing about podcasting, you know, but you know, basically this is a skill that I've kind of had to learn what I am good at is I can pull stories out of people, right? Because that's basically what a mental health therapist does, right? We know the questions to ask, how to get the person to tell you their story, uh, knowing the right questions to ask to have them go deeper and give you more details. So that has been a skill that's been helpful with podcasting. But, you know, I do have a lot of life stories that I would like to share, but have been a little timid because I, you know, I just don't know quite how to go about and do that. So in reading your book, there's a lot of quick takeaways, but then my other fear would be, but I don't want to overanalyze what I do because I am not one of those people that goes back and listen to any of my podcasts, which some say you should absolutely do. And that's wrong because then you're going to pick out your, you know, your ums and the certain words that you say all the time. But then I feel like, I lose being naturally who I am. And then it almost would sound scripted or that I would be trying too hard. And you mentioned a few of those types of things in your book too, where you said, if you look in the mirror to practice, stop looking in the mirror, you know, (laughs) and I'm not, I'm not one of those people. And you were like, if you're not one of those people, don't read it. And I'm like, well, I'm not, gosh, I've never done that, but let me read and see what he says. Um, And, you know, you were talking about the rehearsing of it is like, that's not a great thing to do. So how do we kind of take some of your suggestions in this book and try to improve our skills, but also not to the point where we almost become self-conscious and then we lose being authentic to our audience. Right. I, I guess what I talk about is something in the book called the dinner test which is your story, no matter where you're telling it, on a stage, you know, in a lecture hall, in a classroom, or, or, or at dinner with someone, it should essentially be the sort of cousin of what you would tell, you know, your best friend at dinner tonight. Uh, and so that means you don't have to sort of gussy up your story to a great degree. You don't have to really, um, you know, people who put alliteration into stories, they talk about the purple plums were particularly plentiful. You know, that, that's terrible. Like that doesn't, that never sounds right. I, I tell people to like, just imagine telling a story to a friend. And what we're going to do is through the process of my book and my teaching that I do, we just make sure we add some craft so that it is Um, easier to understand and possibly more suspenseful and we're using some humor strategically and we land in a really good place and we take off in a really good place but ultimately um, it's it's supposed to just be a story that you would tell at a dinner table and maybe just a little more formal and you shouldn't be afraid of the mistakes at all Mike the director of the moth Catherine Burns she once told me that the beauty of storytelling is in the mistakes because that tells us that the story isn't memorized or overly prepared, that we're really being honest and vulnerable when we're speaking. So I I wouldn't worry as much about it as um, many people seem to worry about it. Yeah. Well, Matthew, thank you so much um, for being a guest. I love the synchronicity of how this happened. And, you know, I was really just excited to read this and actually have a little bit of a training manual here. You, You said that you are actually teaching workshops on it as well, right? Yeah, I teach workshops, and we actually have a podcast now where um, we've been producing shows for five years and recording stories that all that time, and each week we air one of those stories, and then my wife and I talk about what's working really well in that story and what could be improved. So it's, um, it's entertaining, but it also provides a bit of instruction as well, so that can be helpful to you as well. Great. And what is the name of that podcast? Oh, right. I keep forgetting to tell people. <laughs> my wife wants to kill me. It's um, Speak Up Storytelling. <laughs> Speak up storytelling. Okay. And how about your website if people wanted to actually come and take a workshop? Uh, That's MatthewDix.com, my name. And I teach teach lots of different workshops. I I teach a beginner's workshop that's designed so you don't actually have to speak ever during the workshop because so many people want to sort of learn, but they're not ready to share their full truth in front of strangers. So I have lots of different versions of workshops to accommodate whatever people need in terms of their development and where they are in their growth. 
Great. Well, I hope that this, um, you know, conversation helped some of our listeners, maybe who are podcasters themselves, or if they are doing storytelling in some way or have a story that they want to tell, and they're trying to figure out a way to get it out. I would highly recommend Matthew's book. Again, it is story worthy, engage, teach, persuade, and change your life through the power of storytelling. Thanks, Matthew. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. If you want more information about our films, visit our website, path11productions.com, to purchase DVDs or to rent and stream each film. You can also find our trilogy of films on iTunes, Amazon Prime, and Gaia.com. You can still use our smartphone app for both Android and iPhones. Just search for Path 11 in the Google Play App Store, or if on an iPhone, look for Path 11 in the iOS App Store. Catch you next time. Thank you.